Welcome class to EKG Chapter 2 Electrophysiology. As we know, a cardiac cell at rest are electrically negative on the inside compared with the outside. Movement of charged particles, which we also call ions, of sodium and potassium into and out of the cell causes changes that can be picked up by a sensor on the skin and printed out as an EKG. We'll first talk about depolarization and repolarization. The negatively charged resting cardiac cell is polarized, meaning it's at rest. It's no movement, no ionic movement. It's just there. There are sodium ions primarily outside the cell and potassium ions primarily inside the cell. Though both these ions carry a positive electrical charge, the intracellular, which is the inside of the cell, which contains potassium, has a much weaker positive charge than the extracellular sodium, which is outside the cell. When the inside of this cell is electrically charged and the polarized state is in its readiness, the cardiac cell is ready for an electrical action. When the cardiac cell is stimulated by an electrical impulse, a large amount of sodium rushes into the cell and a small amount of potassium leaks out, causing a discharge of electricity. The cell then becomes positively charged. This is what we call depolarization. During recovery, sodium and potassium ions are shifted back to their original places by way of the sodium-potassium pump, an active transport system that returns the cells to its negative charge. This is what we call repolarization. So this is one cardiac cell as you show on the demonstration here, where it has negatively charged potassium cell and positively charged sodium cells. Because remember it says that is more, the potassium cells have a weaker form of positive charge, so therefore they're more negative than positive. I think this morning I had it backwards, so I'm correcting myself now in this PowerPoint. <clears throat> this is what we call our polarized phase, meaning they're just at rest. There's no activity. Once an electrical impulse passes through the cells, that's when a rush of sodium comes into the cell and potassium starts to leak out, which change the ion to where there's mostly sodium cells and potassium cells are now outside the cell. This phase we call depolarization. <clears throat> to return the cardiac cell back to normal, sodium potassium pump is introduced into the cell, which pushes out the sodium due to the fact that if you have too much of a good thing, eventually it has to go away. So with the sodium potassium pump, being that you have left potassium, the potassium will stay behind and the sodium will push out, thus bringing back the cardiac cell back to its original standing, which is what we call repolarization. Depolarization and repolarization are the myocardium's electrical stemi. Myocardial contraction and relaxation should be the me mechanical response. Depolarization should result in muscular contraction. Repolarization should result in muscle relaxation. Electrical stimulus 
precedes mechanical response, there can be no heartbeat, which is a mechanical event, without first having a depolarization, the electrical stimulants. Next, we'll talk about the action potential. The action potential happens into four different phases. The first phase, which is called phase four, it's when the cardiac cell is at rest. That is when the negatively charged ions are at resting in the transmembrane portion, meaning you have the it's the flat line that you see just before it peaks into a P wave. This indicates electrical silence. Now, I just want to put a little side note that the human heart relies on four electrolytes, four main electrolytes in order for the heart to pump or in order for the heart to function. You have to have, and I'll try to write it here, um, electrolytes and excuse the handwriting because I am not still learning how to write with this. So there's four main electrolytes that help the heart function. Four main electrolytes to help the heart. To function. They are sodium, potassium, kind of figure that, sodium, potassium. Then you have calcium. And then you have, lastly, chloride. These are the four main electrolytes to help the heart to function. Just a little side note. In phase zero, this is when the cardiac cell is stimulated by an electrical impulse, which triggers off depolarization. This is what we correspond with as our QRS complex on an EKG strip, which is what it looks like is just a spike rate form that represents depolarization of the ventricle myocardium. Phase one and two is what we call early repolarization or plateau phase, which is signified by our ST segment on the EKG strip. This is when calcium is released resulting in ventricular contraction. This is the flat line that follows after a QRS has been formed. Usually we don't separate phase one and phase two. We put them together because they happen pretty much simultaneously. That's why you can either call phase one and phase two early repolarization, or you can call it the plateau phase. It means all the same thing. Next, we go into phase three, which we call rapid repolarization or simply repolarization. This is when your sodium and potassium ions go back into their normal place. We usually correspond this on an EKG strip as the T wave, which follows the ST wave and it represents ventricular repolarization or we call it ventricular relaxation.
here's what an action potential graph looks like. So as you can see, the flat line just before we get to the P wave, which is here, is known as phase four, or we can call it the resting phase because that's when the cardiac cell is at race at rest we receive an electrical impulse which triggers off your atria or your atriums to contract which is signified by the p wave p wave is atrial <coughs> excuse me is atrial depolarization and if don't mind if I abbreviate it so P wave signifies atrial depolarization then we go into phase zero which is our QRS which is here this is Q. Q is deflected by a negatively charged wave, followed by R, which is usually an upward deflected wave, and then S, which goes back into a negative deflective wave. This is what we call phase zero or ventricular depolarization. And there again, I am probably going to abbreviate it because I am writing way too big with this depolarization. And you can finish it, depolarization. That is phase zero. <coughs> <clears throat> then we go into phase one and two, which is signified right here. This is what we call the flat line right after our S wave goes up. This point right here that is circled is what we call our J point. This is the telltale sign of when we're going into our plateau phase or our ST segment are our phase one and two are our early repolarization phase. This little flat line here has all those names. So this in our action potential is our phase one and two. In other words, our early repolarization phase or our plateau phase, meaning it's plateauing out, meaning it's phasing out. After your phase one and two, you go into your phase three, which is signified by your T wave, which is a broad upward sloping wave. Phase three is our repolarization phase, which is signified by our T wave. Right. So refractory periods. Now, basically with refractory periods is you have three different periods. You have your absolute, your relative, and your supernormal period. When a impulse is in its absolute phase, it simply means that no other stimulants, no matter how strong it is, can cause another depolarization, meaning another wave can't form right behind it, meaning you can't have a PQRS, uh, you can't have a PQRS, QRS, then a P. Basically, that's what it means. It cannot form another depolarization. When it's in its relative phase, a strong stimulus can cause a depolarization, but usually this doesn't happen until after you have formed your first QRS then you might see another R wave, not necessarily a whole QRS, but another R. 
interrupting your supernormal period is even a weak stimulus can cause depolarization. This is what we call cardiac hyper, uh, cardiac cell that is hyper, meaning this is how sometimes your premature beats are formed. And as we go through it, as we go through, as we move further along into EKG, you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say a premature beat. So basically, I can give you a description. When you when I say premature beat, it means basically you have a PQRST, and then all of a sudden you'll have a QRS and then you necessarily may not have a T or you may have a T and then it forms another P QRST. It hit not in sync with the rest of the rhythm. <clears throat> That's what happens during supernormal periods when a weak stimulus happens. And this is when the refractory period happens. So in absolute, all during this time, you having your QRS all the way to your PATO and part ways just before your T waveforms, no other rhythm can, no other impulse can come through or disturb this flow. During your relative, you can't, if your T wave is starting to form, yes, another impulse can come in and form another PQRS T wave. It's basically what it's saying. It can form another PQRS T wave. And during your super normal phase, it can happen as soon as the T before it even deflects down into the resting phase again, or your phase four, you can have another beat appear, then it'll go into rest, and then it'll pulsate out back to an absolute rhythm. That's usually what we call our premature beats or absertions or escapes. This is basically what I covered today in lecture in Zoom. If you have any questions, please feel free to text, message, remind. I look forward to hearing from everyone on Friday. There is another Zoom meeting set up for 10 o'clock on Friday. And hopefully I'll be able to see more faces. I thank you and have a nice day. Bye bye. Welcome back to chapter two electrophysiology lecture. <clears throat> Today we'll be covering EKG waves and complexes. As you know, depolarization and repolarization of the atria and ventricle results in waves and complexes on an EKG paper. Today I'll be deciphering what each one of those waveforms mean. The first wave we come across is what we call our P wave which signifies atrial depolarization. P wave, a normal P wave is small, rounded, and upright. And it occurs right after the polarization phase once it receives an impulse. That is the first wave you come across on an EKG readout is your P wave. The next wave is called the TA wave. This signifies atrial repolarization. This wave is usually not seen because it occurs almost simultaneously as the QRS is being formed. The next waveform you usually see on an EKG readout is what we call our QRS complex. This signifies ventricular depolarization. A normal QRS is spiked in appearance, consisting of one or more deflections from the baseline. So meaning if your baseline is here, as you know, you're first going to see your P wave, and then you see your Q, R, S, 
wave and it appears off the baseline. Your next wave after your QRS wave has formed is your T wave. This represents ventricular depolar repolarization. The normal T wave is usually broad and rounded, and if the QRS is upright, the T wave is usually upright also. If there is a QRS complex, there must be always a T wave right after. Always remember Newton's law of physics. For every reaction, there's an opposite and equal reaction. As in the cardiovascular world, that simulates depolarization and repolarization. So and basically, for every depolarization, there must be some type of repolarization or reset. Kind of follows Newton's law. So if we draw a baseline here, and sorry, it's so, we're going to make our P, Q, R, S, then our T, and then of course it resets right on the baseline. So this is our P wave, which signifies atrial repolarization, depolarization, our Q, R, S, signifies ventricular depolarization, and of course our T wave signifies ventricular repolarization. Every once in a while, if your heartbeat is slow enough, you'll see what we call a U wave, which is a late ventricular repolarization. It is not normally seen. It can only be seen, as I said, if a heart rate is slow enough. If your heart rate is slow enough, a U wave will form, signifying a late ventricular repolarization. Usually if you see a, T, a U wave, it'll come right after the T, it'll place right after the T on your EKG strip. So I'll show you. So on this diagram, you see there's P, which signifies atrial depolarization, followed by your QRS, which signifies ventricular depolarization, then your T wave, which signifies ventricular repolarization, and there's your U wave, which signifies late ventricular repolarization, meaning it hasn't completely relaxed yet because it's pulsating at a slow beat. This is what we call your baseline, where all your rhythms pretty much sit on. That is your baseline. <clears throat> so for each and every PQRST sequence, it's one heart signifies one heartbeat. The flat line between the P wave and the QRS and between the QRS and the T wave are called PR segment and ST segment. Your ST segment is a flat line that comes between QRS complex and T wave, whereas your PR segment comes at the flat line between your P wave and your QRS complex. Your baseline is the flat line between the T wave of one beat and the P wave of the next beat. This is also called an isoelectric line, which is close to baseline. Atrial contraction occurs during the P wave and the PR segment Ventricular contraction occurs during the QRS and the ST segment. 
when the atrial depolarization when the atrial depolarization a P wave is written on the EKG paper following this the atrial contracts filling the ventricles with blood then the ventricles depolarizing causing a QRS complex on the EKG paper the ventricles then contract Next, we'll do some wave and complex identification practice where I'll go through a couple of these strips with you to show you exactly how we would identify these waves. So as you can see, this is our baseline, correct? Let's see. And draw this a little straighter for everybody. This is what we call our baseline right here. And maybe if I draw it in a different color, it'd be easier to see. This is our baseline. Whoop. That didn't go too good. So let's follow our baseline straight across and get it as straight as possible. All right. So <clears throat> we're going to follow it and there's no Q. So there's an R here. I'm sorry, hold on. And erase, 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 erase. So as we know, if we had a P, it would be P. Q usually goes down, R usually deflects up, then S. We don't have an R wave, so this is Q, S, then T. Same thing here, Q, S, T. Q, because remember Q goes in the negative deflection, S goes in the negative deflection, and R goes in the upward deflection. So this particular rhythm is a QS wave followed by a T wave. Let's look at the next one. So this one we have a P, an R, a S, followed by a T. After that we just have a bunch of P waves. P, 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 and P and no QRS following. The next rhythm strip, we have P, R, S, T. Then we have P, R, S T R S R P R S R T Well, R prime, sorry, prime.
If you notice when you make an R S R prime, it kind of looks like an M. That's how you can tell you have a R S R prime. Let's take a look at this next wave. We have Q R S R prime then T Q, R, S, R, prime, S, T. Sorry, I forgot to label the S on the other one. S. Same thing here. This one we just have a Q R S T. This one we called a flat line or a uh, A-stall where there's no electrical activity whatsoever. It's no waveform, no electrical activity. Your heart has completely stopped. All electrical outputs have decease and desist. It's flat line. We did talk about yes on Wednesday, QRS non-mucaviers, where your Q wave will have a negative deflection that occurs before a positive deflection, and it can only be one. If present, it must be the first wave of the QRS complex because it is alphabetically correct. It's P, Q, R, S, T. Your R wave which is any positive deflective wave and it can be more than one because you can have an R and you can have an R prime. So when you're labeling your waves, if you have one R, the other R must be written as R prime or R with a comma after it. Your S wave will be negative deflected, meaning in the downward direction that follows an R wave and sometimes you will see a QS wave where you have negative deflection with no positive deflection meaning you'll have no R upward R wave. For example, this is just an R. This is an R wave. You have your QS, QR, RS, QRS, RSR, or R prime, sorry. And this is you done this for homework and I checked everybody's work and very good. Next, we'll talk about cardiac conduction system. As far as the cardiac conduction system, which is a pathway of specialized cells whose job is to create and conduct the electrical impulse that tells the heart when to pump. <clears throat> the area of the conduction system that initiates the impulse is called a pacemaker. 
The cardiac conduction system. So the cardiac conduction pathway is such as this. It goes through the sinus node into the intraatrial tract to the atriums, down into the intranodular tracts, to the AV node, down the bundle of his, through the bundle branches, through the Purkinje fibers, to the ventricles. So you receive an impulse from the sinus node, which is the main pacemaker. It goes through the intraatrial tract into the atrium. From there, the impulse travels to the atrium, as we said, down into the intranodular. the impulse does. From there, it goes to the AV node, which is here, down the AV node, down the bundle of his, down to the right and left bundle branch, down the Purkinje fibers, which are these fibers here. These are what we call Purkinje fibers. These are Purkinje fibers and they're on the right and left bundle branches at the end, at the very end, which signals the ventricles to contract. So the impulse originates from the sinus node, which is located in the upper right atrium, just beneath the opening of the superior vena cava. <coughs> The sinus node is the heart's normal pacemaker. It is, like I said, the boss pacemaker. <clears throat> From there, the impulse travels through the intraatrial tracts. Then special conduction pathways carry that impulse through the atria to the atrial tissue. The atrial then depolarizes, which makes a P wave. Once that impulse travels, it goes through the intranodular tract to the AV node, which is a specialized group of cells located just to the right of the septum in the lower right atrium. The AV node slows the impulse transmission a little, allowing the newly depolarized atrial to propel their blood into the ventricles. And so it slows down just a little bit for the blood to start to flow into the ventricles. <clears throat> then the impulse travels down to the bundle of his, which is located right beneath the AV node, to the left and right bundle branches, which are the main highways to the ventricles. Then the impulse is pulsated through the Purkinje fibers, which signifies the ventricles to contract. That is the conduction pathway of an electrical impulse. Right. There are two, there are four different types of cardiac cells, which has several different characteristics. You have automaticity, sorry, speech is kind of funny. Conductivity, excitability, contractibility. Automaticity is the ability to create an impulse without outside stimulation. Auto should auto automatically tells you that it's automatic, that it has, it doesn't need an electrical impulse. It automatically does what it needs to do on its own. Auto, self starter. Conductivity is the ability to pass the impulse along to the neighboring cell. That's what your intraatrial and intranodular, that is their job. They pass along the impulses to other parts of the cell. That is their job, is conductivity. There are conductors. Excitability is the ability to respond to the stimulants by depolarization. Hence, when the atrial contracts, it makes the P wave, and when the ventricles contract, it makes the QRS. That's the excitability cells. That's what's impulsed out through the Purkinje fibers for the ventricle. And then you have contractibility, 
which is the ability to contract and do the work, which is the ventricles themselves or the atriums. They're the contractibilities. The first three characteristics are electrical, where the last is mechanical, because they're the worker. They get, they have to do the job in order for every, all the rest of them to perform. Thus, the sinus node is the normal pacemaker of the heart. Other cardiac cells can become the pacemaker if the, the sinus node happens to fail. So. Let's take a look. As you know, the sinus node is your normal pacemaker. It has an inherent rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute, which is what any normal heart is supposed to be. When you take your heartbeat or you take your blood pressure, your heart or you take your pulse, I'm sorry, you take your pulse rate, your pulse rate is supposed to be anywhere from 60 to 100 beats per minute. If for some other reason the SC node just stops working, the next pacemaker that takes over is your AV junction, which is what we call our backup pacemaker. It has an inherent rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. Now, yes, your heart can still pretty much function at a normal capacity, it's just at a slower rate. And sometimes people who SA nodes have failed and they're in AV junction mode, they're usually um, patients who are on oxygen or sometimes people who um, um, you see on oxygen and sometimes those are people who sometimes suffer from COPD. If for some other reason, say your SA node goes out, it fails, it doesn't send out an impulse, the AV node can no longer function or send out an impulse. Well, then your ventricles take over. This is your lower backup pacemaker. This is your last resort. This is the last chance for your heart to still beat. Of course, it's going to be at a slower, much slower pace than at the AV. Its in heart rate is only 20 to 40 beats per minute. Can a person still survive just on function, a ventricular function? Yes, they can, but a of course, it brings other health problems into play, and they try not to let a patient stay in ventricular mode pulsating for very long. That's when they would install a pacemaker. If a, if a person goes into ventricular pacemaker mode, they usually install a pacemaker to help the atriums contract by sending out an electrical signal. So you have like an artificial sinus node. And that's a lecture for another time when we go into pacemakers. So the fastest pacemaker at any given moment is the one in control, which is true. We have what we call escape rates of, this is what we call escape beats or escape rates. So it's like a race of who's faster. And a normal heartbeat, we know that the sinus node is the faster pacemaker because your heart is beating at a regular pulsating tempo, which is 60 to 100 beats. But what if for some reason your SA node is being sluggish or is not pulsating out? Well, guess who becomes the stronger or the faster pacemaker now? your AV node. That's what we call an escape because in the normal conduction world, SA node is first, then your AV, then your ventricles. So for some other reason, your AV junction became the faster. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Then we call that an escape. So whenever a lower pacemaker serves as backup or an inhabitant from firing or inhibiting from firing as long as some other pacemaker is faster. So if another if your sinus node for some reason becomes sluggish and 
the AV junction pulsates out first, it escaped because it's not supposed to. Normal conduction of a cardiac impulse is dependent on the health of each part of the system. Failure of any one of those parts of the system necessities are variation. So as you can see, sinus node, atrial, makes the P wave. AV junction, ventricles perform the QRS. That's the normal conduction of how it's supposed to flow. So what if the sinus node fails? So if sinus node fails, guess what doesn't happen? Your atriums don't contract. Your AVs, so you won't have a P wave. So your AV junction sends out an impulse. Then it goes backwards. Then it goes forward. Because now your AV junction has to tell your atriums to contract in order for your ventricles to go through. So if the impulse comes from the AV junction, it goes backwards, then it goes forward. So what if sinus node fails and AV junction fails? Well, how you're left with your ventricles? Well, guess what? There's no atrium contraction because your ventricle is trying to do the work all by itself. Escapes. Escapes occur when predominant pacemaker slows drastically or fails completely and a lower pacemaker takes over at its inherent rate. Preventing a new, providing a new rhythm that is slower than the previous rhythm. An escape beat is any beat that comes in after a pause that's longer than the normal heartbeat to heartbeat cycle or R to R interval. Escape beats are lifesaver. An escape rhythm is a series of escape beats. Let's take a look at this. So, and this, this is what an escape beat looks like. It pulsated correctly, because you have P, R, S, then T, then all of a sudden you get this pause, meaning your SA node for some reason did not send out an impulse. So your AV node takes over. So that's why you have a wide and bizarre R, and then it looks like a little S and then T. So you have your R wave T, R wave T. So that's all. You, that's an escape beat, meaning it. And then you see it. It's beating at a slower pace than what it originally beat at. This is an escape beat. Absertion. Absertions are also called irritability which means to take control away from and occur when one of the lower pacemaker becomes irritable and fires in at an accelerated rate, still in control away from the predetermined pacemaker. Absertion results in a faster rhythm than before and it starts with a beat that comes in early than expected. So. As you can see, it's pulsating at a slow beat, then all of a sudden you have an assertion, meaning it goes and takes over. It says, it knocks the other rhythm off and say, hey, I'm taking over, you're moving too slow. And then it starts pulsating out. That's an assertion. So escape, just an escape beat just, just pops up to save your life. Proper function of the conduction system results in a heart rhythm pattern of successful depolarization that originates in the sinus node. <clears throat> Abnormalities can produce arrhythmias, which are abnormal heart rhythms, can prove harmful or faithful, 
fatal if not treated appro appropriately. Next, we'll talk about EKG paper. So as you know, when we do a printout of an EKG rhythm, you have 12 different lines. On those lines, you have squares, big, big squares and little squares, which make up a whole six second EKG strip, which is what we called a 12 lead EKG printout. This is how we're gonna measure our intervals and our altitudes. So it's basically graph paper divided into small squares, which are one millimeter in height and width. Dark lines are present every fifth block to subdivide the paper vertically and horizontally. Counting horizontally measures time, which is intervals. In seconds, counting vertically measures amplitude, which is height of the complex, which we measure in millimeters. So when we're doing PR intervals, we count across. When we're saying how tall our wave is, we're counting upward. All right. So for every big block, signifies one second. One big block, or should I say, so five big blocks equals one second. One big block equals 0 0.20 seconds. And one little bitty block equals 0 0.04 seconds. That's why we multiply by 0 0.04 seconds is because when we go to calculate PR interval, we're just looking at a certain segment of that whole PQRST wave. 12 lead EKG printouts are printouts of the heart's electrical activity view from 12 different angles as in 12 different leads. Leads are an electrical our electrocardiographic picture of the heart's electrical activity. We place leads on a patient's limbs and chest in order to get a picture electrical of the electrical activity of what their heart is doing and it gives us 12 different views of what that patient heart is doing. Rhythm strips are printouts of one or two leads at a time to assess heart rhythm. Recorded on special paper about three to five inches wide, a six to 12 second strip is usually obtained and interpreted. So sometimes you'll see a single line EKG renewal which looks like this. And sometimes you'll get a double line EKG printout. The benefits of a double line strip is that both leads show the same rhythm just viewed from two different angles. Therefore, both leads have the same rhythm intervals and heart rate. Usually when we see a double line, I usually tell the students to pick which line you can see the clearest because either one will give you the same PR interval, QRS complex, QT interval calculations. It's just which one can you see more clearly a PQRST wave out of on a double line. <clears throat> Two leads provide twice the chance of identifying the rhythm. For example, P waves not may not be visible in one lead, but might be clear in the other. Having two leads shows how the same rhythm can look different from two different views or two different leads. That's why it's very important to say, that's why I say when you see a two lead EKG reading, pick which one you can see clearer. It doesn't matter because they're both going to be the same. It's just one's a little clearer than the other one. They're just giving you two reviews of what we already seen. So this is 
what an EKG printout looks like without the PQRST waves. And this is a 12 lead EKG. We have leads one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, which is what we call our limb leads. Those are our limb leads. Then we have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. These are our chest leads or our pericardial leads. Chest leads. And of course, this is just a six second, a whole six second strip we usually use to interpret what's going on with the patient's heart. And usually we look at lead two, because usually it's the most clearest lead once we get a full printout. Intervals. Intervals are measurements of time between the Q, PQRST wave and complexes which the measurements allow determination of how the heart's efficiency is working and how conduction pathway is pulsating out. This tells us if the heart is pulsating or contracting at a normal rate or abnormal rate. It's by calculating intervals. The first type of interval we learn how to calculate is what we call our PR interval. Our PR interval measures the time it takes from the atrial to the ventricles to receive an impulse. So basically, how long does it take your atrium to repolarize, I'm sorry, to depolarize and to repolarize in order to form your QRS? Normal PR interval is anywhere from 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. Measured by the beginning of the P to the beginning of Q, <clears throat> QRS, which includes the P wave and the PR segment. So if we look at this, let's draw our baseline as clear as we can and we draw out our P, Q, R, S wave. Our PR interval measures from the beginning, let's draw another color, blue, from the beginning of P to just before you get to the downward reflection, downward deflection, of Q. This is what we call our PR interval. Alright. The next interval we look at is called our QRS interval. This measures the depolarization of the ventricles. How long does it take for the ventricles to depolarize, meaning how long does it take the ventricles to contract? Normal QRS interval is anything less than or equal to 0.12 seconds. Usually between 0.06 and 0.12 seconds is what we consider a normal QRS interval. How we measure it is we measure from the beginning of QRS to the to its end. So let's draw our baseline. So we have our P. Ugh. Nope. So we have our P Q R E. Ooh, it's a crappy S. Let's try to. S, 
and we just want to draw a T just to see it. So remember, we ended we ended our PR segment just before the downward deflection of Q. Well, guess what? That's where we're going to start our QRS complex. And this point right here is where we're going to stop, which measures our S. This point here is what we call our J point, which signifies the end of our S. And that's this is our QRS complex. Q. I mean, I'm sorry, our QRS interval. But it is our QRS complex. But we're calculating. When we're calculating, we're looking for interval. When we're looking for it, it's called complex. QRS interval. The next interval we sometimes take a look at is our QT interval, which measures the depolarization and repolarization time of the ventricle, meaning from the start of the QRS all the way to the end of our T wave is what we include in our QT interval. Now there is no norm for QT. QT is norm is specialized as a personal individual's health determination. So if a person has suffers from obesity, their QT interval might be slightly different than somebody who is an athlete and in good shape. So QT doesn't have a norm. It's just, it depends on the person's physical, healthier determination and a cardiologist's determination. So now let's take a look at the intervals. As you can see, PR intervals at the beginning of P to the beginning of Q. That's what we consist our PR interval. Our QRS interval pretty much picks up at the end of where our PR interval is to the J point, which is at the end of S, when S starts to go up just before it flattens out. Remember, this point right here is what we call our J point. <coughs> Oof. And then our QRS is from the Q all the way to the end of T. That is our intervals. We do calculate. QR at QT, not so much, but definitely PR and QRS. Determine the intervals on a large rhythm strip that follows. PR interval, count the number of small blocks between the beginning of P and the beginning of the QRS. We're going to multiply that by 0.04. For QRS interval, we do the same thing. We count the number of small blocks between the beginning and end of the QRS complex. And then we take that and multiply that by 0.04 because we're only counting the small blocks, not the big blocks. For QT, we do the same thing. We count the number of small blocks and we multiply that by 0.04. Now for homework yesterday, I had y'all do these strips. So let's take a look at the first one. Now my lines, I'm going to say now, excuse me for my lines, because they're not going to be straight. Cause so we're first going to calculate PR interval. <laughs> Okay, so if this was straight, which is supposed to be, that's one, two, two, three, four, 
three blocks if I was straight so we're going to take three times that by zero point zero four which equals zero point one two but guess what don't forget to write seconds because we're measuring this in seconds So for QRS, we do the same thing. We go at the J point. So here, and then here. So that's one, two. So that's two times zero point zero four which equals 0 0.08 seconds always put seconds because we're measuring in seconds and then for QT we're going from here again all the way to the end of T which is here which we have one, two, three, oh, I'm missing, wait, here, goof, here to here, one, two, hold on, I'm getting confused here, I'm looking at too many lines, <laughs> so, that's one, two, three, four, five, and six. We don't count halves. That makes it a little more complicated. So we just count whole numbers. So that's six times 0 0.04, which equals, um, just had a brainstorm here. Four, mm -mm 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 -mm. six times zero point zero four equals zero point two four seconds. All right. So hopefully you got these numbers on your first graph so let's take a look at one of the other ones a little more typical one so interval practice now we're going to do some interval practice on a normal uh ekg paper now whenever i do look at EKG graphs when you're looking at it from a real perspective just remember what I see and what you see as long as we are within one to two seconds of my answer you're still correct just remember that so say if I come out with 0 0.20 and you come out with 0 0.17 no 18 well, you're two, 0 0.02 seconds within my scope because I came out with 0 0.20 and you came out with 0 0.18. So you have 1920. So you're still within two. So long as your answer is within two of my answer, you're still in good shape you may not see that last block where I saw that last block so it's is what you see as far as the human eye now if you're way off sector then that means your lines are either too far in or too far back and that's when we would correct it so let's take a look at not this one this one's easy 
Let's take a look at this one. So we have R here. We have T. And then we have P, R, T. Because guess what we don't have is a Q and an S. Because remember, Q is ne like negatively down. S is negatively down. This is only positively defected up. So first thing we're going to do is calculate our PR interval. So it'll start here. And I will promise to try to draw this straight here to here. Oop. It's a promise. So to here. Alright, so this is our PR interval. So if we count the little blocks, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Hold on, let me erase one of these lines. I might be too far. No, I'm right. Well, actually, it's not on the line. It's in between the line. But I can't draw straight with this. There we go. There we go. Oh, it erased this one too. Shoot, shoot, shoot. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, six. Okay. So six times zero point zero four. And then I'll equal give you an answer. And then of course you always have to put seconds. Then next we need to find our QRS. So from here to here. One, two. So we have two times zero point zero four. And of course QT is from here to here, which is in the middle of the block. Middle of this block here. And yes, I'm going up so you can see it's in the middle. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, seven times zero point zero four, and all this is in seconds. All right, so. That's how we calculate PR interval, QRS interval, and QT interval. And that's just more examples which you did today for homework. This concludes our lecture on chapter two. Basically tomorrow for our forum on Zoom, it is an open forum as to for me to answer any questions you may have as far as con pertaining to chapter two. Hopefully you listen to this lecture first before 10 o'clock. So that way you can form any questions, ask me questions, and I'll explain. I thank y'all and have a nice day.